Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Welcome viewers. It's George the Antique Nomad, and I'm glad to be with you again. This is my special eBay live haul, and this goes out to first to the level two members who sponsor it. And thank you so much for all of you level two members who are helping make this happen. I'm really grateful to get to show more things, talk about more, and show some premium items. I have items that will be listing on eBay that range from $10 to $1,000. And what I'm doing is picking out 20 of my favorite things that I want to make available to the public. And thanks to the level two members, I'm able to put out a video related to that and share all this great information with you. So thanks for coming along and let's get started. The first item that is going to be up for bid and you'll be able to uh, follow the links is this piece here. This is Hager. And this is a 1980s Hager piece. I have not seen this strong two-tone design before in my travels. I found this in a little tiny shop last week in Parrot, Georgia. Parrot, Georgia used to have a bunch of antique stores. They're down to one, but it's a good one. And this was in it. Everything else was very traditional. So this just jumped out as something that needed to go elsewhere. And Hager is so popular now. They were in Dundee, Illinois for many years. They only closed about 10 years ago. And this piece was very exemplary of their 1980s lines. They really went big in the big 80s. They started mainly designing for furniture stores. Everything was big. It was leaping gazelles and dog figures and everything big and the things that were not figural were very deco in design because the 80s were all about deco revival. Everybody in the 80s was really into designs of the 50s and the 30s and those echoes came forward into the 80s. So you've got this great geometry and the two-toning and this is just a really neat piece. It's going on eBay now and I'm excited to see how it does because like I say, I've never seen this particular piece before and people really are enjoying Hager these days. The next piece, I'm doing a lot of small items this time because I'm going to be in Florida doing shows in January and so I'll be shipping from there. So I wanted a lot of little things that will be affordable to people to get shipped to them. This is a pretty piece. It's got a almost uh, sparkling carnival glass rhinestone in the middle. That's called Aurora Borealis. They didn't do carnival glass in rhinestone jewelry until the late 50s. And this is when this is from, because this is one of the last pieces made. I don't know how visible it will be, but there is a tiny, tiny mark right there that says Scaparelli. And Scaparelli, or Scap as she was called by her friends, was Elsa Scaparelli. And she was one of the big designers. Uh, she was Italian, but she did a lot of designs in Paris in the 1930s. She really got people away from the corseted look and into things that were more free-flowing and fit the woman better and were comfortable to wear. And she also did some really cool surrealism. She did a lobster dress with Salvador Dali back in the 30s, way before Lady Gaga thought to wear meat. Elsa Schiaparelli had people wearing lobsters. Uh, she did a lot of really neat things. And the jewelry, this piece is 1950s with the lavender and the moonstone. It is a nice signed piece. It's one of the last pieces made. Uh, she didn't really keep up with the post-war trends. And so when Dior and Coco Chanel came along, she basically retired and got out of the business. This is a very pretty piece and it's going to be put on for a lot less than they actually sell for, but I expect that this will go somewhere in the $50 to $75 range because Scaparelli is one of the best names in costume jewelry, so it was fun to have a piece to show to you. Okay, let's see. The next piece here, this is something that's going to be familiar to a lot of you because we do see this around. 
but it is the Franciscan Desert Rose pattern. When Desert Rose came out in 1941, it was one of the first of their sculpted lines. You'll notice this is all raised and embossed off of the surface. And all of this detail is hand painted. I met a woman in her 80s back when I first got into the business who'd been a hand painter for them for years. And she said, oh yes, it was mainly women who did this work and they got paid by the piece. So they were in a hurry to do good quality, but fast. And there was a reason they had to be fast. Desert Rose was the most popular dinnerware line ever made. They sold 60 million pieces in the first 20 years. And you can see this one has what they call the TV mark. Franciscan was based in California. And this mark is sort of shaped like an old TV screen. And that mark was the mark in the 1950s and 60s, which makes sense because, well, television. So. The cookie jars are one of the harder pieces to find, and people like them sometimes even if they're not collecting an entire set of this. I used to see these sell, there was a time when dinnerware was really expensive and popular, that this would have sold for $200. Well nowadays they sell for about $75 to $80. We're going to start it at about $39 and see where it goes from there. I believe that there will be a customer for that because, you know, we're indoors in the wintertime and we need cookies. I wanted to feature a few more jewelry pieces because this seems like it's been very popular with viewers. So let me put this up where hopefully you'll be able to see it. I'm going to get out of its way. This is a little violin pin and all of these delicate strands are sterling silver and they are all made using a very fine technique where they have to lay all of these individually and cast them and then uh, somehow weld them together without it all showing. It's actually quite intricate. And it's done on amber. So they've attached it to a piece of amber. This is Baltic amber. Uh, this and one other that I'll show were actually found at the Chopin Museum. So the great classical composer Chopin was from Poland and this was at the museum. The amber is from Gdansk in Poland, which is the big amber market. They have, it's a wonderful city. I had such a good time being in the Polish amber markets the one time I got to go. It's a Hanseatic League era city, meaning from about 14 to 1500 is when most of the buildings in the downtown were built. And there are just blocks and blocks of people selling nothing but amber. Raw amber, amber jewelry, figurines made into amber. It is the world center of the market. So it's fun to bring you a piece that came from somewhere that has such an interesting heritage and history. And I said that it was a violin, but you know what? It's probably a cello. I need to work on my instruments a little bit as far as identification. Now this next little piece is the Metropolitan, the British police whistle, the official one. And you can see on the back what it's gonna look like because there we've got it. And I'm gonna take it out of its box. My grandmother sent us one of these for Christmas after she'd been to England in the mid 1970s. They really became sort of a thing for a while. And a lot of them were issued, they have a nice little paper in here showing the English bobby there blowing the whistle and we can try it out just for fun. I won't go really loud. These things can be really really thunderously loud if you want to blast them. That was just a very brief little uh, pop of air there. But they're a fun novelty. This particular one is in the chromium plate and it's got the Metropolitan on it. And people use these for a lot of different things. I know women like to take whistles with them for safety these days, but also uh, when I was a kid, my mom, we had big woods in the backyard and we'd go out and play and she could whistle and we could be a quarter mile away and hear it and know that it was time to come home. Uh, people use these for dog training. People just like to have them around as an ornament. So I figure somebody's going to enjoy that. This is not a high dollar item. We're going to start it at $10 and see where it goes. They usually sell for about $20. It's nice that it's got the original box, though. I thought that kind of added something to it. 
All right, what is in the green box? Well, let's put this up here. I had the good fortune to come across a whole bunch of John Beswick items related to Beatrix Potter. And Beatrix Potter is well known in this country too, but in a special favorite of people in England and English Commonwealth countries because she was from there and because her stories were all about Peter Cottontail and all of the people related to him. And what we have here is a tableau. It has never been out of the box. These were made right about the time that Beswick was acquired by Royal Dalton in the late 80s and early 90s. So this has everything. This particular one is from 1999, so one of the last that they did. But it's got the certificate. It's got its tableau. Uh, really, a tableau is where you've got multiple porcelain figures, but they sit on this nice base. So there's your tableau. And this particular set are Tom Kitten and Moppet and, oh dear, I really need to know who this other guy is, and it says on the box. Tom Kitten, Moppet, and Mittens. Okay. Should have figured out Mittens. And they're having a nice little tete-a-tete -tete here. It was a wonderful story where mice and cats actually got along. And of course, everybody knows Peter Cottontail because he was that naughty bunny who got in all sorts of trouble. Beswick was the company that got the rights to make the Beatrix Potter figures. Originally, they came out, I believe, in the late 50s or early 60s. They were very popular. And by the 1990s, there were a lot of collectors looking for more advanced figures, and this is one of them. These typically sell for about what they sold for new, and according to this box, this one says, I think if I'm reading right, that it sold new for about $50, and that's about where they usually sell for now. I'm starting it at a lower price than that, and we'll just let it go and see what happens. But I think they're very cute. The hand painting is really good. Beswick really did capture the flavor of the characters, and that's the reason that they got the commission. Let me see what we have next. Oh, yes. I thought this would be fun. It's something a little different than I usually sell, but I just came across a large collection of fishing lures. And here we have a pikey minnow. Now, there's a few companies that made pikey minnows, and not all fishing lures are marked this way, but this one's nice. Ooh, I'm going to try not to hook myself here. Could be a short video if I do. So there it says pikey minnow on it. There were a couple of other companies that made these. This one is wood. Wooden lures are more desirable, all other things being equal, than fiberglass or plastic or the later things. People really like the wooden ones. Now, the wooden ones are hard to find in great shape, and this one is in pretty good shape. But if you look on this side, it's got a few little nicks and scratches, but it does have its glass eyes, and the glass eyes are intact. The hooks are not rusted. It has its uh, leader here, and that's in good shape. And that's the important part, is that all those things be complete. Fishing lures can be rather valuable, and I'm excited about this collection I've gotten because I think I probably have a few dozen, and I haven't had a chance to inspect many of them, but I pulled this one out, thought he's big, he's interesting looking, and he'll be the first one to go, and here he comes. So this guy is going to be listing on eBay now, too. And I generally see these in this condition selling in the $20 to $30 range, so we'll see how this goes. And I managed not to stab myself with it, so I feel very happy about getting through that one. Now, I've noticed that there seems to be a lot of interest in boudoir items and collectibles as well. And one thing that seems like it's done really well is compacts, which is nice because I always liked compacts. When I first got in the business, I had friends who were dealers who primarily did compacts. And I used to buy and sell them a lot. And then uh, for a while, the market got kind of quiet. Well, now people are really interested in compacts again, so I'm picking them up. And I found this one recently. I thought it was very pretty. It sort of clashes with my shirt, so let me get out of the way. But in and of itself, it's a lovely magenta color. I like the wire work on it. 
It's chrome, and it's got tons of rhinestones. The center one is an aurora borealis again, so that tells us that this is probably late 60s as well as the color. The nice thing about this one is this one can be practical for a whole lot of people because it is all about the mirror. This is simply a mirror compact, meaning I can take this, check myself out. I can, in my case, I can look for the face and chin hairs at the same time. And that might be useful for a lot of people, I don't know. Uh, in any event, I thought it was nice looking. It does not have a name on it, which is unusual. It looks like something made by Stratton in England, but I have tried and tried to find a name on it everywhere and I haven't been able to find one. So uh, we're just gonna sell it as a no name, but it's pretty, it's a great poppy color. And these seem to be going in about the $20 range. So we'll see how this does. Now, I always have liked watches. I have a pocket watch from when I was very young. It was given to me, it was my great, great, great grandfather's, and I still have that. I don't wear them, but I really enjoy timepieces. And this one I thought was especially interesting. This one is an aviator's watch, and what makes it different is it's from Russia. I don't know how well you'll be able to read, although the focus looks pretty good. But this one's got the mark that says it's by Movet. This is an aviator watch. What's nice about it is it's got the original leather band, and that's also marked in Russian. So all of this is 100% authentic. Now this is from a big collection, and I haven't had time to get batteries for all of these. I am selling it as if it's working. The gentleman I got it from insists that it works. He did not have a fresh battery for it either, and this is fresh stock to me, so I'm just putting it out there. I am guaranteeing that it works. You really have to. I mean, it's eBay. If you say something works and it doesn't, people rightfully expect their money back. Uh, but this one, it's been used so seldomly that I have no doubt that it works, and it's got all sorts of extra dials for uh, timing, and for the second hand, it's got stop and start capability. So it's a nice watch. The Russians actually made pretty good watches. Uh, this one we're starting at $49.99, but I have a hunch that it could be as much as 100 to 120, and we shall just find out. It's nice that it had the phosphorescent. I don't know that I showed that either, but it's nice that, see the greenish color? That's all phosphorescent paint. And that means that when you're in a dimly lit place that those hands are going to glow and you're still going to be able to see what time it is. So, nice looking watch. We started getting more of that sort of thing from the Soviet Union towards the perestroika years. So that is likely to date from about 35 years ago. Oh, yes. Okay, well... Keeping with the jewelry theme, although I think we've only got one more piece after this, but I wanted to put this out and give someone a chance at it because I just think the beads are so attractive. This is what they call Italian wedding cake beads, and I'm going to hold it up close so that you can see a little bit more as to why. See the detail there in the pink and all of that? Notice how it's three-dimensional. It's actually coming off of the glass beads. That's because each of these beads is individually decorated, and they do it very similar. They actually use something similar to how you apply the frosting to a cake when they make these. They use some sort of a little squirter, and they actually squirt enamel, which is glass and paint and suspension on it, and then they fire them all. And then after that, they have to string them all together. They put these gold filigree pieces on, and they put the clasp on. The clasp is a barrel clasp, and we see barrel clasps in the 1960s, so that's when these are going to date from. It's a lot of work to make these, and a lot of times when I sell these, they actually go to people who are taking them apart and using them in other projects because they realize how expensive the beads are. There are 40 of these Capri Blue beads with the wedding cake decoration in this, and it is starting at $29.99, which is about 75 cents per bead. So this could end up going to a crafter, but it would be great if somebody who understands how pretty it is and likes these colors were to wear it. 
It's not going to necessarily look good with my red sweater, but I'll put it on so you can see how it would lay. It has a nice long drop. It's 20 inches, so it's not going to strangle you. It's not way up tight around your neck. It would look good with a sweater as well as any sort of a solid color top. Or if you're really into pattern, you could just mix it with whatever you like. Anyway, 1960s Italian beads, I think they're very pretty, and I said they were 20 inches, but I'm looking at my notes and realizing they're actually 22 inches, so a little more sumptuous. This next piece I find very interesting, and it's one of those things that I think is a perfect eBay candidate because it's rather obscure, but that's part of what will be fun. Uh, one thing I encourage is, if you're enjoying this and you're curious how these things actually do, please follow along on eBay and you'll be able to see the actual completed sales. I'm the antique nomad on eBay, just like here, so I'm easy to find there. And I'm not shy about sharing information, as you know, so I'm happy to have you look at my completeds if it helps you to figure out what you should be paying or pricing things. Um, the thing that I find interesting about this piece is, again, I like things like this to go online because this is something that's going to be a very specific collector. But look at that neat shield. That is enameling as well, uh, glass and paint suspension that's fired on. But this has been fired onto a sterling fob. And the lettering is also enameled. The lettering, which you may be able to see, says police, firemen, letter carriers. That seems like a curious combination, but this is actually a union fob or fraternal organization fob, and on the back it's marked Sterling down on the bottom in very, very tiny letters that you may or may not be able to see. But this Sterling fob would actually be for the union uh, of policemen, letter carriers, and firemen. And that was the group that banded together in New York in the early 1900s to form a collective unit so that they could do things like get insurance and benefits. And I think the thought was that letter carriers at that time were outside being exposed to the elements, being exposed to dogs, being exposed to random who knows what, and that there was some danger associated with that. So they actually put them with the police and firemen and I actually got this from an estate where the guy was a letter carrier in New York. So I thought that was a neat thing. I am starting it out at $9.99. That's less than the value of the sterling. So I certainly expect it to go up from there. Uh, it's got just a little bit of wear on the high point right where I'm pointing there. So I want to point that out because I always like to, uh, I feel it's very important, especially online, but really everywhere in this business. Your reputation is what you have. It is so important to give an honest representation. Honest as to condition, honest to the way things are, because that is, people are gonna know as soon as they get the thing. And if they're not happy, it's gonna come back to you. So why play around? Just tell people what it is and let people decide what they feel is acceptable for them in their collection. This guy is fun. You may have seen me find this in an estate in Seattle. It is Jim Corbett. He was quite an adventurer. Some of you may have heard of him, even though he's a few generations ahead of us, because he was such a, um, he was just known for having these crazy experiences. This particular one is his story of the experiences with the man-eating tigers of Kumaon and to the excitement of the chase and kill which Lieutenant Colonel Corbett imparts in a simple and direct but vivid and dramatic style. Well, let's be the uh, judge of that. So he's showing us in here where he is in this part of India and they are chasing down a tigress. And let's see here, I think we'll flip open. So while I'm thinking of it, Please comment in the space below here and also hit the thumbs up button to like this video. If you haven't subscribed, click the subscribe button below. Also hit the bell below to be notified of new videos coming every Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And thank you so much for following along. Let's go back to this video. 
It is a popular belief that man-eaters do not eat the head, hands, or feet of their human victims. That is incorrect. Man-eaters, if not disturbed, eat everything, including the blood-soaked clothes, as I found on one occasion. However, that's another story and will be told at another time. Yeah, I could wait for that story, I think. In any event, the man-eating tiger was on the loose in India, and Jim Corbett was sent over there to track her down, take care of her, and write this book about it. And this book was very popular when new. This came out in 1946. This is the first American edition. It's got the dust jacket. Dust jackets are very important to the value of older books. People really like to have them and have them intact. And it also keeps the book nice. This book is in very good condition. No cracking on the spine, no big bumps or bruises, just a little at the bottom here. When you're evaluating books, you want to talk about bumps and bruises on the corners, whether the spine is cracked, meaning is the spine still connected to the book or does it just flop open? Uh, this particular book is in good shape, no missing pages, a little bit of soiling on the top. Soiling is something you see a lot in book descriptions, and that's because book collectors want to know how dirty is the thing. This one, the only dirt is on the top, and it's from having sat in a bookshelf for many years, so I think they read this, put it on their shelf, and it sat there until I came along. Anyhow, it's a good book, it's an interesting book, and it is starting at $4.99. But in reality, they sell anywhere from about $15 to $30 for that particular edition. This next piece here is one of these little union cases. These are compressed, um, they have a, the compressed wood with the leather top and they are made in the Victorian era. And the reason for them is that people started to be able to have photos made. And this one is a very early one. This is called a daguerreotype. Daguerre was a Frenchman. He had an offer from the French government if he could perfect his silver colloidal printing of photos that they would sponsor him with a big pension and make the technology available to everyone, which they did. That was a pretty neat thing of them to do. You'll notice a ring around the edge of the image of the woman. That's because these are done using mercury vapor on the back of glass plates, and it was a complicated and difficult process, so it didn't last too long. These were only made about 10 or 15 years, and then they were replaced by more modern technology that was easier to deal with. So this one is an ambrotype. That's why you see the tarnish, because some of the silver has tarnished. This one is called a ninth plate, and that has to do with the size. The sixth plates, which were about an inch bigger on each side than this, are the most common from the era. These little ones were to be made so that you could have it in a pocket and then take it out and show. And they had to have these elaborate cases because the glass was protected in that manner. The important thing is, is the case solid? And yes, it is. It hasn't been taped. It hasn't fallen apart. It has its hinge. The image of the woman is interesting enough. Uh, people like children the best, I would say, for portraiture, but this woman has a nice outfit and it shows well and the image is still strong. So for those reasons, I think this will be a hit. And I'm starting her at $19.99, but they usually sell in the $30 to $40 range in that size. So we'll see what happens with her. This next little item I just thought was so cool when I got it, and it's so little that it makes more sense to put it online than to try to sell it because it just gets lost. What we have is a little pin, and it is a radio mic, the old style, and it says NBC, not just on the side, but on the top it says WNBC, and that's what makes this one particularly interesting. WNBC means this is from Radio City Music Hall in New York because this was where NBC Radio was at the time. And this is from the late 40s before television, so this was a big deal. This was actually worn by a woman who worked at Radio City M Music Hall in that period of time. And so that's why it has the WNBC logo instead of just some local 
NBC affiliate or just generic NBC, and that makes it more interesting. It's got a good solid pin back on the back. She took good care of it, but it would have been a little lapel pin. And these are pretty hard to find that are actually from Radio City Music Hall because you had to get one there and it generally was for the workers. They weren't really released to the general public. I think that makes it more interesting and it's amazing to me that this little tiny thing was never lost. It's in excellent shape and of course it's very easy to ship. So that part will be nice for all of us. I am starting, whoops, if I don't lose it in the meantime, like I said, <laughs> I don't know how some of these things lasted and hopefully it will outlast me. In any event, she is a about a half inch total size and if you are a radio fan or interested in broadcasting or that sort of thing, it might be the perfect thing for you or for somebody who likes that sort of item and I'm starting it at $19. They typically sell in the 25 to 30 range, so I'll be curious to see if there's somebody out there who recognizes that and has an interest. Now, next item that I want to show is this. This is a pouch or a reticule, very similar to the way that they were made in Victorian times, except that this one is later, this is 20th century, because it's Native American made, and that's why you have this interesting design on here. I believe this is Plains Indian. You can see it's got a nice liner in there, which is cloth, and then all of this work, where not only did they have to, uh, onto the leather attachments here, they had to sew all of those little attachments, but somebody set all of these beads by hand. This was not a craft project. This is from the 1950s or 60s, but this was something that was done on a reservation to be sold. And the condition is excellent. There's not a flaw on it. The pattern is interesting. It almost has an Asian feel. Of course, there's a lot of speculation about the connection between Native American tribes and Asia and how they came to be here. But in any event, I just think the geometry is great, the colors are good, and the colors, again, because you've got these shades of green and blue together, tell us that this piece is probably around 50 to 60 years old. Just a fun thing for a collection for somebody who likes beaded bags. It's a little different than the usual thing that you see from the Victorian era. And we're starting this one at $29.99. It's 11 inches from the closure to the bottom of the fringe. So it's actually got a nice size and it would look fun on a wall, but I once in a while see people actually carry these for dress up or just for fun. So I thought it was fun and bright and happy and we're getting close to happy new year. So happy things are a good idea. We are also getting close to the end of an era. And so with that in mind, I decided to put this online. I am curious to see how it will do because again, we are getting close to the end of one administration and the start of another. And so I thought it was time to put out this item, which is from Trump's castle. And this is a tape measure, which is kind of funny. I'm not exactly sure why a casino would give out a tape measure. This is a self-winding thing from about the late 1980s when Trump's Castle opened. It didn't stay Trump's Castle very long. It then became Trump's Marina. It then was sold to the Golden Nugget, uh, has the license for it now, and they operate it. It's one of the few that are still operating in Atlantic City. But I think anything presidential is always collectible and interesting, and particularly because he had a life before he was president and there's ephemera from that life. So I think somebody will find this a fascinating thing to carry into the future and it is starting at $10. They usually sell for about 20. So we will see what the interest is there. But I do believe that anything that has to do with changes in administration is always of interest to collectors. I've got another pin here I want to show. This is the other of the two. 
also from the Chopin Museum in Poland. This one is a trumpet or a coronet done in a similar manner. This is all sterling wire made into these forms and then they shape the piece of amber. It's not easy to shape amber this small. Amber is a natural material. It's actually a tree sap and it's fossilized. Uh, there was a big forest apparently off of the northern coast of Gdansk in Poland in the Baltic Sea that was flooded at some time in times immemorial and has become a petrified forest under the sea and the, the amber washes up on shore after storms. There are not that many deposits of amber in the world and that's why it is considered a semi-precious stone and it's a little bit difficult to work with in smaller pieces like this because it actually is tends towards fissures and it often has things, uh, inclusions, because tree sap would run down and say a bug got stuck in it and was fossilized along with it. People really like that, by the way, if you can find it with bugs and other things included. But because of that, there's lots of little impurities in amber, and so it's hard to do small pieces because they often break when you're trying to make them. Um, this is vintage. These both have some age. Um, they just are really fun and I find that pins that have to do with musical items are something that people really enjoy. Uh, anything that can be worn by a musician means frankly that you have uh, as a reseller. We like it because we know that it's more unisex for example. A guy who plays in a band might be as likely to want a piece like that as a woman who plays in a band or likes music and goes to shows or that sort of thing. So it gives it a little bit more of a market. And of course, I like that because I want more people to enjoy stuff. So we will put that on at $45 and see how it does. Next here we have this little tin. I got a number of talcum powder tins at a place in Washington State and I kind of held this one aside because I thought it was one of the nicer ones. I showed its mate in another video and I called it Coty and got a lot of fun happy responses from viewers saying it's Cody, not Coty. You must be a guy and I am. I have to admit I've read this word for years. I've never actually paid any attention to how it was pronounced. And I love to massacre French pronunciation. I don't love to, I just do it naturally. But this is emeraude, which is one of their more popular scents. It has most of the talc in it still. That may or may not be a good thing. I'm happy to send it with the talc in it. I don't recommend using it. They've come out with a lot of information lately telling us that talc and that sort of thing is not really healthy for you. But it does have Let's try to open this gently here so I don't get it all over myself. Is it a turn? Hmm. Oh, there we go. Press and lift. Oh, I see. No. Okay. Again, me being a guy. It turns out this just presses it for open and shut. You don't actually take the cap off at all. And that way you can shake it out as you wish. I thought this was a very pretty tin. I thought it was the nicest of all the ones I got, actually, and so I saved it for special, and to me this is that moment. Uh, the green colors, the, the shapes, it's almost got the feel of a Turkish rug, and this would have been done around 1930, and it's in really great shape. It came from a part of the country that is very dry, so it doesn't have any rust or any of the problems that you might associate with damper climates with these. So because of that, I thought it was a good time to put this out there. Uh, it's going to start at, I believe, $14.99. And I will be curious to see what the upside on these are. I've seen some of these sell as high as $35. So we'll see what the interest level is. But I do definitely think that they're very pretty and that someone out there will enjoy it. Now we're on our penultimate, and this might take a little while because this set is 
rather extensive. I'm going to start setting them up here and we'll talk about them a little. You'll notice some different patterns as we get to these. You've got the bridge here, you have florals here, you have some that look more like blue willow. These are by Spode, and Spode, of course, is one of the most venerated of the English porcelain makers. They have always made very good quality wear, and what this is is part of a collection called the Blue Room, and so I will show you the bottom here. The Blue Room collection was done about 30 to 40 years ago, and what they did was they revived some of their original blue and white transfer wear patterns from the early Victorian times. A lot of these patterns originally came off of tea wrappers and printed material that was sent over with shipments from the Orient, uh, primarily from China, because they had the big uh, merchant trade with China, and so they were happy once they figured out how to make their own porcelain to use those designs. But there are other designs as well. This one is fun because it's naturalistic. You have a bunny and a turtle and a fox, and this particular one is called Aesop's Fables. So that's a neat pattern. And you'll notice that some of these have the name of the spice on them, like cinnamon here, and some of them do not, like this one which is the grasshopper pattern. And you'll see here the detail in that. So each of these is a little different from each other, but when you put them all together, what you have ultimately is a spice set that can hold, in this case, we have 14 different jars. Now, some folks said, oh, you ought to just sell those one by one because people will want the one they don't have in their collection. But you know, I got a good deal on this, and sometimes when I get a good deal on something, I just like to send it on to a collector. And so, even though these individually would sell for about 10 to 15 a piece plus shipping, I am doing the entire set starting at $49.99 for all 14 of them, which is a real deal. And if uh, somebody is lucky enough to get it for that and it doesn't get bid up, well then they'll be getting a real bargain. This one's oregano, and this one actually um, says originally was $31.25 new, so um, this is a chance to get a really nice spice set, all for one price, all at once, and I'm happy to be able to put it out there. And Spode is just a company whose work I've always really, really liked, and I, I think it's rather exceptional in quality compared to a lot of other porcelains. So we will be excited to see this go to a new home somewhere. And our final piece is this guy here. You said, gee, we didn't see any thousand dollar items. Well, now you're looking at one. This guy is pretty amazing. I'm not going to say that he's the most attractive fellow, but he represents a really great cultural era in Costa Rica. This would have been made, it's pre-Columbian, this would have been made sometime between 700 and 1100 AD. So this is a true antiquity. This is a thousand years old. It is a jaguar effigy vessel. These are found in the Nicoya area of Costa Rica. This particular one has good provenance, which is important because these are not allowed to be exported anymore. But there was a time up until the early 1960s that it was legal to take these out of the country. In fact, a lot of people were making a living there, robbing graves and then selling these to tourists. This particular one thankfully came from a better place. It was actually part of an organized archaeological dig. And this one came to me from the estate of a pair of educators and they would go every summer they didn't have kids of their own so on their summer vacation they would go to another part of the world and teach for a few months partly to keep their hand in it and partly to give back to other places that were 
more disadvantaged and didn't have our educational system, they thought there was something that they could uh, do to help. And I thought that was a wonderful story. And one summer in 1957, they spent the summer in Costa Rica and taught down there. And this was something that they got from an archeological dig. Uh, this particular piece, if you'll listen, you think, oh no, what's going on in there? That's terrible, there's something broken. Well, no, that's not actually the case. The truth is, is that they put rattles in the legs. So it's supposed to sound like that when you pick it up. It uh, was a noisemaker. These were buried in tombs. They had what they called shaft tombs. And a lot of times these pieces would be buried with a chief when the chief died because they needed someone to accompany them to the afterlife. So they'd make a lot of these small shaft tomb figures and then sometimes more elaborate pieces. This also could have been used in ceremony. Uh, but then again, at the end of the chief of the village's life, a lot of this stuff got buried with them. And this particular one has really good color. You'll see the detail painted, a lot of geometry. This is all hand done. The other thing that you'll want to know about these is that a lot of them, again, because they were buried for years and because a lot of non-professional, non-archaeologists dug them up, a lot of them ended up having damage either from being buried or uh, from being struck by a shovel, that sort of thing. This one does have a little bit of damage. You'll see a hairline crack here, but see inside, this was professionally stabilized. That's why you see this sort of overpaint. And there were some parts missing. See where there's no paint on the back? I like the way that they restored this because what they did was where there was a chunk out of it, they restored it with the proper clay for the body, but they did not attempt to paint it again. So they're not trying to fool you into thinking it was perfect. They just want it to be complete. This back foot, you can tell, is a little different color than the others because the bottom of the foot was missing and you can see some other plain spots here. There were chips on the feet. So these folks had this restored and stabilized so that it would not break anymore and nothing bad would happen to it. These can be very valuable. If this was in perfect condition, which few of them are, they can go between $3,500 and $7,500. This one having been restored, it's the only piece today that I'm not putting up as an auction. I'm actually doing it as a buy it now and or a fixed price. And it will be a fixed price of $1,000, which is about $250 less than any of them have sold for recently. But I need to find a home for this. I, I want it to go to somebody who appreciates it and enjoys it and understands its importance. I like it to be with someone who really values having something that's a thousand years old in their collection. And honestly, I would like it to go somewhere where I am not handling it. It's been to some shows, it's been to a few places with me, and I'm really nervous about, I don't want to leave it in a store where it's going to get handled a lot. I, I really think it's time for it to go somewhere to its ultimate collector. So I am willing to really pack this very well to get it shipped so that it can go to the place that it's supposed to go. And I'm excited to see what the takers are. I put a few very expensive things on the last time and I did have offers on the mice and box. They were a little lower than I was willing to accept. Uh, I did sell 17 out of 20 items from the last haul though. And I thank those of you, I noticed some of the members got to have them and that just makes me very happy. That's part of the reason that I like to do this is that it puts it out there where you all have a chance to see it, look at it, and really contemplate what it is and know more about it. And then if you like it, it's yours. So thank you so much for joining me for this again. I'm really enjoying bringing these to you and I'll have another one hopefully very soon. If I ever get caught up on the rest of my schedule, maybe we'll do a couple of these a month at some point. So take care and thank you for joining me. I'm George the Antique Nomad on Instagram, Twitter, no longer Periscope, that's going away, but I am on YouTube here and on Facebook, so we'll see you again out there somewhere soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. 
please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!